after the revolution of dignity, it was for the first time during the whole history of independent Ukraine when we felt kind of the beginning of flourishing and demand for Ukrainian TV and cinema product. Before 2015, I didn't, I wasn't a scriptwriter. I was a TV reporter. I was working on the news. Then I was the editor of the reality show. And I was the participant of all of those two revolutions you've just listed. And uh, I felt my internal need to tell some story. Stories which were taking place with us, with our country. And something has changed only lately. During all of these years, I heard vice versa, that the Ukrainian is not interesting. Ukrainian language is not interesting. Just remember the huge number of this artificial reality, uh, TV shows and byte formats, acquired formats, which were sold for Russia and for CIS countries. I think that lots of the producers bear responsibility for the current situation and for such an informational wrong space we had. And as for cinema, yes, we had some new money allocated for the auteur movies and for the commercial movies as well. People were driven to the Ukrainian cinema. And as a result, every festival of A class has already a Ukrainian movie as of today. This is the achievement. I moved back to Ukraine from uh, Moscow, actually, in 2015. But uh, my views from outside is uh, maybe this is useful analogy for American screenwriters. Just imagine that Ukraine is Canada and Russia is United States, Hollywood, right? And all movies are being produced, direct and written in Hollywood, but they've been shot in, uh, in Canada. So Ukraine uh, served as, uh, about the same for Russia. Everything was produced in Ukraine, all TV series, some of the films, because it's cheaper. But all the directing, writing, and acting talent was in Moscow. And that uh, kind of drew talent from Kiev. But when the Revolution of uh, Dignity happened, uh, the Russian productions were banned from Ukraine. And all these uh, screenwriters we see right now, they had this great chance now to become number one and to write their own story. And that was the moment when I moved back to Ukraine because I thought uh, I, I can't work with Russians anymore. I, maybe my talent will be more required in Ukraine. We don't feel like something has changed because we have war in our country for, for eight years. Yeah. The only difference now is that the world is looking at us. The, and now <laughs> we can be louder and more pronounced with our narratives. We'll just continue to be Ukrainians and do what we do best. Uh, and we're very sentimental and uh, loving and uh, uh, hospital people. Uh, so I think our stories will reflect on that. The thing is that we are all exhausted in working on this topic for eight years already. I was only working with this topic and that's it. I didn't want to come back to this topic because it's a kind of uh, middle ages to write about that only because the world is dynamically developing. The processes are ongoing and still you are living in your own personal existential experience, constantly thinking about this black hole, about this evil and just to find out how it should be. Around us now, there are lots of painful points, lots of grief around us. But simultaneously around us, I mean around Ukrainians, there is so much love and so much light. And I personally, for myself as a scriptwriter, I understand that I would like to tell the stories of this love and this light which we feel now from each other and from the world to us here in Ukraine being in the total hell. To some extent, it's not a Ukrainian war. Let us say that it's the world war. But this is the war where the world versus darkness. Maybe the future narratives will be about what Olena is telling us about. That there are lots of people, nations and people involved in this war and our future stories will be about that we will become more international a kind of the worldwide european production which will tell the story of the health friendship and victory not only suffering pains and horrors 
I thought for a long time which genre is closer to me, and I chose comedy because Ukrainians have really a very cool trait of character. We have a fantastic sense of humor, and this sense of humor is very warm, family sense of humor, domestic sense of humor. Even when it's ironic, it is still warm. Uh, so when the full-scale war began, it seemed to me that whatever I did, all of that comedy is just senseless. There is so much pain around me. Which comedy could it be? But living in this war, I see and I know that if not our warm, kind-hearted family sense of humor inherent for Ukrainians, I don't know how we could survive through those horrors. I would like to go on dealing with this warm, cool Ukrainian comedy to overcome this pain we live now through. There, there was a trend to show ourselves as the nation of suffering. Uh, and I didn't really like it because that, that shows more weak. Now people are perceiving themselves as more strong, aggressive, and the nation that cannot be uh, made slaves or destroyed. There is a trauma because you, you have no idea what to do. Like, I'm comedic screenwriter, I'm killing people, right? And this, this is my trauma. The best thing which we can do now is to stop any relations, to forget the word brotherhood, brother. This is a very manipulative and wrong story. And if we turn our faces to each other out after our victory, only when they acknowledge their blame, including their cultural activists who have a direct relations to what has taken place in their country and in our country. So during these eight years, they had enough time to acknowledge what they started. For me, it's this point of no return, at least for some time. This is the obvious historical parallel about how the relationships were going on after World War II, what was the attitude to the Germans who bore responsibility, they carried responsibility for fascism, which they brought to Europe and to the world. So I think we will have something similar. The word Russian for Ukraine will be a synonym of enemy for a very long time and a torturer as well. I think we, as creative people, as screenwriters in particular, filmmakers, we will have to take on the task of uh, healing Russians from what they have stuck in their minds right now. And this will, will be better done with films than with anything else. It can be convincing or anything else. I think we have to produce a lot of films, uh, high quality films, and they'll download them to torrents, they, they'll do, uh, go through different loopholes to watch them because the industry will die, it's obviously. They won't have technologies or equipment to make films, neither, I, I hope they won't have any money to do their films. So they will watch a lot of Ukrainian films. And now we have to put our narratives in those uh, very entertaining, and high quality, I don't know what's gonna be, movies. And uh, I think we have to, we have to work on uh, treating the nation from the actual fashion that got so deep under their skin, they don't even notice. I think that we will be a catalyst, a kind of, well, first of all, no one expected from us that we will uh, provide and show such a resistance, that we would be an example for the whole world. We were not expecting from ourselves that. I'm saying that because during the last month, six or even seven countries uh, which I visited asked me about that, and I had an opportunity to answer this question. I think that there will be lots of tectonic shifts, global shifts, because there are lots of situations where there are such painful moments which uh, we, similar to which we had with Russia, and they are in this latent state and with our own example, we'll give the opportunity to the others, geopolitical processes to begin to launch and maybe to re-sow, re relaunch, reboot the stories of the global policy. And when we write and tell about our own experience, our resistance, about our war, 
maybe it will become helping for other people, other countries in similar situations to solve and to raise their own issues. The world now sees Ukraine as we know it already and as we love it because we always were about courage we always were about the resistance when the enemy is coming to us any enemy the enemy from within the country as a corrupt president or the enemy is such a huge external enemy which the whole world uh, considered to be uh, powerful but the king turned out to be naked i mean the huge and powerful russian army we felt this in the air in a month, in several months, when we felt this tension, we felt it already. We could believe that it would take place, we could not believe, we could believe that there would be something, but it wouldn't be a whole bloodshed, what Ukraine is now overcoming. But still, I personally and my friends, we had any anxiety maybe or any other worries we felt rage we felt anger that they don't want us to uh, uh, to construct our country but we didn't feel fear well of course we can't say it we are not afraid we are afraid for our children we are afraid for our relatives for our parents but globally when we face such a huge enemy we don't have any fear because this is our land we love it and we are fighting for it I am living almost in Bucha. I used to live there. During the first day of this full-scale war, I understood that Kiev is so far, that is 20, 25 kilometers. So I decided to invite all of my friends, please come to us, it is safe here. So the next day we were cut from Kiev and we were under occupation. Thankfully, none of my friends had time to come, but me, two of my children and three dogs spent 15 days in the basement in this sadly known place where almost everybody uh, who lived in Bucha stayed, I'm in the basement, and we had to overcome this um, experience. We didn't have heating, we, were, uh, we had three degrees below uh, zero, we didn't have light, of course, power or food. So somehow, during the last uh, year, instead of uh, throwing away old bread, I decided to collect it and to make dry bread. I don't know why I did it, but I just stored it in the roof uh, and everybody was ridiculing me. So we had to go to the roof to take those little bags of old bread, dried bread, and this is what we ate. The lack of food and water and heating can be overcome, but the worst was because we had Russian tanks close to our windows. They were constantly hiding between the buildings. They were just really close to my own building. And I was afraid most of all that our artillery can uh, shoot against them, because it would be obvious they wouldn't know whether there are civilians in the houses, but the huge columns of tanks and armored vehicles was along our small street and around my house. So every second I was afraid that we will be shelled and our existence will be over. And also I was really afraid for my children, just later, we got to know when we fled, we got to know that what really happened in Bucha. But I was ready that the worst can happen. During one night, they tried to get to us. So I had to keep my dogs not to begin barking. We just pretended that the house was empty, that there is no one inside. So thanks God, they did not come in too our building. I don't know who those were, maybe looters, maybe Russian soldiers, but the children spent only three seconds to hide in the shelter and they were very quiet. So thankfully we were so lucky to avoid the fate of so many victims who died in Bucha. But we couldn't flee. 
because the the cars with the white flags and within scriptures children were just shelled and shot once i tried to do that but the woman uh, with her two children was killed just in front of me in the car in front of me so i came back and th then we had three more attempts to flee and when it uh, was the fourth attempt i just understood intuitively that we can do that so just in three seconds it was 7 a.m i put my children into the car and well as it often happens in good movies when we have both tragic and comic uh, things simultaneously i put the saucepans on their heads and uh, i take uh, uh, and I put some of the uh, gas stoves around them because they are kind of armored just to protect them. I took my dogs and cats and not a single thing because children, dogs and cats, I couldn't take anything more. So we went through Russian checkpoints, which were there, three of them were there. And now we knew that sometimes they can let you in but then they shoot you in the back but somehow there were not a single checkpoint and we had to get to the dam to the dam uh, out of bucha so we didn't see a single checkpoint and the scariest part of the way was uh, the way of death we were calling it the way the road of death this was the road of Zhitomir road which connects uh, uh, the west and Kiev, and there were tanks which were shelling against Zhitomir Road. When we came there, there was not a single tank, not a single soldier, not a single serviceman. We had to get 500 meters to one direction and then to make a U-turn and 500 meters again. Just in one kilometer, we saw the first Ukrainian checkpoint, and this is how we were saved. Uh, the car was, which was following us, uh, our guests, our friends, uh, they called us and and uh, they followed us in two hours, but unfortunately they were shot and, and they died. Uh, the people uh, who were just following us, they wanted to have the same road as we did. They saw the corpses, they saw the dead bodies. This is my experience. Now I came to uh, Vienna, I came from Ukraine, so I came uh, from the people who are patriotic, believing in ourselves, but the more distant I am from Ukraine, I can feel indifference and void as attitude towards us. We shouldn't have any illusions about ourselves. We should search for narratives. We need to search for other ways to be heard. Because here, people still in Austria, for instance, where I am now, they don't want to quarrel with Russia. And there are lots of countries left who are not ready to support Ukraine. So our force and our unity is obvious for us. It's not obvious for them. I am now in the UK. I'm in Wales. What can Wales have in common with us? But still, I meet lots of people here. I give interviews at the local TV. And what I see here is something incredible. I never expected to have such a huge awareness, first of all. People are watching Ukrainian news 24 7. Any TV channels, first and foremost, showing Ukrainian news. And the support is incredible. It is so huge that I'm even feeling a bit awkward because I'm now the representative of Ukraine in Wales and I'm thinking whether I'm worthy enough to represent Ukraine. But you know, sometimes you're coming to some country and you're so excited, you're so sure that everybody understands you and loves you. But when you face just this abyss, well, I just mean that we need to be ready, that we need some cultural cooperation, political cooperation to achieve understanding because the Russian propaganda machine is still working here.